Matt comes to read our scripture. Do you have the text? Uh, it's 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 24. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. All who have this hope in Him purify themselves just as He is pure. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins. And in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. No one who is born of God will continue to sin, because God's seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning, because they have been born of God. This is how we know who the children of God are, and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not... God's child, nor is anyone who does not love their brother or sister, or brother and sister. For this is the message you heard from the beginning, we should love one another. Do not be like Cain who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. This is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. If our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask because we keep his commands and do what pleases him. And this is his command to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one, to love one another as he has commanded us. The one who keeps God's commands lives in him, and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. Our human version of love falls so short. I thought I was was a pretty romantic guy during my engagement. Living in suburban Buffalo, New York, my wife had her own apartment, and I had mine, and On those really snowy mornings, I would get up earlier than I needed to, and I would go down to her car because I knew she needed to go to work, and I would brush it all off, including, get this, man, if you want to learn how to woo a young lady, I drew a heart in the snow on her back windshield. It was the best I had. It falls so short, though, doesn't it? of the love of God. Heard a story about a man who wanted to prove his love for his wife, so he swam the deepest river, he crossed the widest desert, and he climbed the highest mountain. She divorced him because he was never home. (laughs) Uh, Human love, it it falls so short. 1 John 3.16 is where we started the journey, right? This is how we know what love is. Um, We as believers, Christ died for us, and then the second half of that verse, which I want to focus on today because I think it's, it's, it's tough. And we are to lay down our lives for one another. Let me just break the, the, this chapter up quickly and spend more time on the second half of it than the first. 
But the first, first few verses of it talk about the part that the Trinity plays in bringing about our salvation. What God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit did to work for our salvation. Aren't you glad we don't have to work for it? He did it all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed white as snow. My kids remember every mistake I made, and when convenient, they remind me. When I get to heaven and my files open, the pages are going to be white of my transgressions because they're under the blood of Christ. God did it all. In this chapter, we see the Father doing something, we see the Son doing something, and we see the Spirit doing something. The Father's doing something in the first three verses. He bestows his lavish love on us. I love that phrase. He bestows. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us. I I just love that phrase. He bestows his love upon us in the first verse. He calls us his own children in the second verse. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God. Dear friends, we are now the children of God. And that means the person next to you, the person behind you, and the person in front of you is a member of your family. That's going to be important as we understand verse 16. And then finally, the Father promises us that someday, in some way, we're going to be like Jesus. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known, but we know when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. I'm not exactly sure what that means, so I'm not going to guess. But I can't wait to see. So that's the role of the Father. The role of the Son is in verse 4, and then verses 4 and 5, and then a little later on in 8, two things that the Son does in working for our salvation. First, of course, he dies for our sins. In verse 4, everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness, but you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins, and in him is no sin. We all know that. We're Baptists. We know that, right? But the second thing it says in verse 8 that the Son does in working our salvation for our salvation is he destroys the works of the devil, verse 8. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil because the devil's been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. What's the devil's work? I suppose we could make a long list and we could cite things that were on the news last night. But I'd like to suggest that in the work of of people, his number one work is to tempt us. Just to to flash before us. And I know that those of us that have been in the church a long time most of us probably aren't fighting with the top 10 Baptist sins, right? We all know that the sins that we think are the worst are the ones we don't struggle with. That's sort of how we define how bad a sin is. But we struggle sometimes. I, I still struggle walking through Best Buy, man. I, I get what a friend of mine used to call techno lust. <laughs> you know, you just, I see things I'd love to own. I mean, you know, so I, I have my struggles. They're different. And the devil uses those kinds of things to wave in front of me uh, to, to get my eyes off of Christ. So one of his jobs is to tempt. But the Bible says that for the believer in, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, that for the first time in our lives, there isn't a single temptation that comes across our path as believers that he has not, because he's faithful, provided a way of escape out of. That's never happened until we knew his son and because of what his son had done on the cross. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you're tempted, he'll provide a way out. And then the role of the Spirit is in in verse 24. He indwells us. He seals us, Ephesians 4.30 says, for the day of redemption. So that's how the the Trinity's bringing about a working for our salvation. But then in the second half of the chapter, we're encouraged to work out our salvation. That's different than working for it. When Paul wrote to the Philippians in chapter 2, verse 12, he encouraged them to continue to work out their salvation with fear and trembling. Um, it doesn't mean to work for it. doesn't mean to earn it. Uh, it means to, to, to live it out, to flesh it out. And in the second half of 1 John 3, he gives three pieces to that working out. And the first piece of it is what I call the process of confirmation. I still have some friends of mine who I was with. I mean, I was with them on the moment they bowed the knee. Any of you ever taught children Sunday school? You know what I'm talking about. When that little tyke, you know, nose running and hair out of place because mom got him up the last second and has two different shoes on. 
and he's about six, but that's the morning he says, teacher, I'd like to accept Jesus. I was with adults when they did the same thing. But every so often I run into one who every other day doubts whether he's really in Christ or not. And I have to shake them in love. <laughs> you know, say, first, uh, Romans 10, 13 says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Did you call upon the name of the Lord? Yeah, when did you do it? By the way, the person I'm talking to knows when they did it because I gave them a Bible and I wrote the date in it. And I wrote the Romans 10, 13 in it. So they, they never forget. The problem with, with being stuck in that place and not establishing that we are indeed children of God is it allows us or gives us permission to hang out in a spiritual playpen all our lives and never grow. Because I'm always going back to, I wonder if I'm really saved. It's sort of an excuse for not moving forward spiritually. And so John addresses that here uh, by saying, you need to confirm that you're a child of God so you can move on to the next step, which is about loving. How do we know we're truly saved? Chapter 3, 1 John, verse 6. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. Verse 7, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. Verse 9, no one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning because they've been born of God. Now, you're probably saying to yourself, you're telling me that the only way to be sure I'm a Christian is if I never, ever sin. This same John in this same letter wrote these words. If you say you have no sin, you deceive yourself. So which is it, John? <laughs> I'm a little confused. Well, I'll tell you what. Anecdotal evidence, I'm a believer and I sin. <laughs> Confession. Uh, and I don't know any other believers who don't occasionally struggle with it. So I don't think he's talking about perfection at all. I've taught a lot of adult Sunday school in my life and I work with teenagers as, as Matt has. I haven't dealt a lot with little tiny kids in Sunday school. And I admire people that are able to do that. We just lost one of our most precious uh, legends of children's ministry, uh, Joyce Cleone, in this past year. But I don't know if it was Joyce who told me this story. It might have even been you, Linda, who told me this story about a little boy who was kind of a, a rambunctious kid in Sunday school. But one day he had one of those come to Jesus moments where he said, this is my week. Teacher, will you pray the prayer with me? Repeat after me, Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sin. Make me your child and set aside for me a place in heaven forever. Amen. And when the boy was done, he had the biggest smile on his face, and, and he went back home, and, and he came to Sunday school the next Sunday. And the teacher said, how was your first week as a child of God? He said, on Tuesday, I talked back to my mother. I guess I'm not a Christian. The teacher wisely said, you know, before last week, had you talked back to your mother, you'd have never come and told me that. But it bothered you. That's what John's talking about here. There's a spirit conviction where, where after a while you start going, I can't do this anymore. I've had an epiphany. I've had a wake-up moment. That's what it means that you can't go on sinning. It means that the Spirit of God lives in you and hounds you and works on you patiently. Aren't you glad he's patient? Uh, and, and, and helps you to move to the next step. So we establish that we're believers, the, that process of confirmation but then the second piece of it is what I call the practice of compassion. And that's where we're at, verses 11 to 18. And in the middle of that section is our key verse. This is how we know what love is. Christ died for us. In this section, there's an exhortation to love, and then there's an explanation of the extent of that love. To be honest, when I read verses 11 through 15, I thought, John, of all the weird stories to share about the antithesis of biblical love you share Cain and Abel. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Cain kills his brother Abel, and, and John says, unlike Cain, who killed his brother, we are to love our spiritual brothers and sisters. So I'm thinking to myself, if I haven't killed anybody in my church, I must <laughs> indeed love them. Is that what you're saying, John? <laughs> and I can't tell you that at least once in a while, over 40 years of ministry, I hadn't thought about it for a couple of, couple of people I've worked with, but didn't go there. But then I began to think about this Cain and Abel thing. And I realized that the most troubling part of this story for me, and maybe it was for John as well, is that Cain hated and killed a member of his family. 
And that's why John uses this illustration, because he's talking to the family of God, and he's saying, listen, you're all family. I am so suspicious of every advertisement that comes across the television or anything I get in my email that's advertising something or anything on television. And I'm always looking for the fine print, because there always is. It'd be great if I could lease a car for 119 a month, if I didn't read the fine print that said I need to put 6,000 down to start. There's fine print in our salvation experience. When Paul wrote to the Corinthians in chapter 12, he said, you that were baptized into Christ have been baptized into one body. That's the fine print. Little did you know that by receiving Christ, you joined the family. And that's what's sad about this story here of Cain and Abel. Every so often, and not very often, thankfully, but every so often we see a news story. You see, it's, you see a mom whose little boy or little girl, little son or little daughter runs out in front of a moving car or, or crosses a train track with a train and the mother leaps between the car and the child. And without making this morning a downer, you know how that story often ends. One or both are either seriously injured or lose their lives. And when that sort of thing happens and it makes the news, the mother is, is toted by the news reporter as some amazing example of incredible sacrificial love. But the fact of the matter is, the mother did that by instinct. Because that's what family does for family. Now, 1 John 3.16, this is how we know what love is. Christ died for us. Now you ought to lay down your lives for one another. It should be what? Instinctive. Would we ever do that if we had to? Some of the ugliest fights in the church over the years have been over music. Can, can I tell a, a story from our congregation? It's great now being here with the First Baptist folks because I can use these stories again. <laughs> <laughs> Bernice Winson was our church librarian for many years, and when I came, we decided to put a worship team together, which included an electric piano and a sound system and a bass guitar. And she was in panic. And uh, I knew she was, and I loved her and respected her. She loved the Lord, and her service at the church was amazing. So I didn't want to do anything to offend her. I, want, I never wanted to do anything to offend anybody. But I thought we needed to kind of branch out and do some newer things with younger people and so forth. So the first six months, we did the most quiet, reflective, contemporary stuff we could do. And, I remember once she pulled me aside and she said, I was so nervous about this. And she said, but it's been beautiful. And she said, beyond that, she said, the Spirit of God spoke to me and said, I needed to lay down my personal preferences for something bigger than me in relationship to church music. If we won't lay down our preferences for music, we'll never lay down our lives. If we gossip about one another in the church when that person isn't around and we're talking about them, if we won't lay down our right to do that, we'll never lay down our lives for one another. That's what it's talking about. It should be instinctive. I know we've got to wrap up here. I, um, every so often, we get a news story about a national Christian figure. Whether you like Joel Olstein or not, some people are excited about his preaching and others are not, and that's okay. We're all different. But I remember when they had, was it a hurricane down there? And, and he was ripped all over the news for not opening his building. And I saw Christians going on social media ripping their brother, Joel Olstein, for not opening his building. Now, I don't know if he should have or shouldn't have. I don't know the particulars. I don't know anything about it. Maybe he should have. Maybe he shouldn't have. But the point is, we shoot a brother instead of just keeping our mouths shut just because he's a national figure? No, he's my brother. He claims Christ. And I'll never lay out my life for him if I won't close my lips for him and hold my opinion for him so that the world knows we're his disciples because we have this crazy love for one another. Now, I'm not going to defend a Christian who does something wrong, but I'm also not going to put a banner in my front yard announcing that he or she did wrong either. Some of us remember the Jim Baker scandal. PTL Network many, many years ago. It was a big news story. Jim Baker, after his time in prison, wrote a book. And in the book, he tells a story about a surprise visit while he was in prison. 
if you remember the whole story, and I, I, I'm going to get in the weeds here. I'll get out of the weeds quickly, and we'll wrap this up. If you remember the whole story, Jerry Falwell, Liberty University, uh, tried to uh, grab the property of Jim Baker, that whole PTL property. And I'm not saying that was dishonest or honest. He just immediately was in hot pursuit of that property. Um, and others were sort of doing the same thing. Jim Baker's in prison, and he hears from the prison guard that he has a visitor. And you know the visitor was? It was the Reverend Billy Graham. And Billy Graham sat down with Jim Baker, and he said, only you and God know if what you did was right or wrong. I just want you to know that I'm here as your brother, letting you know I love you, and I'm praying for you, and praying for your restoration, and that someday God will use you again. That's, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. That, that's, the, that's the message here. Two minutes, we'll wrap this up. The extent of our love there is in verses 16 to 17, and it's all about family, the family of God. There's a family priority in verse 16. We ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. In verse 17, there's a family practice. You can say you believe that, but if you don't practice verse 17, you're a liar, is what John would say. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother and sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? And then finally, the family principle, verse 18, dear children, let's not love with word or speech, but with actions and in truth. I said this last week, and I'll conclude with this, and I'm not sure where I'm going to go next week. I'm still praying about where to go. But let me, and I might even come back to this as we near Easter. If I'm going to love with real love today, January the 8th, 2023, here, and when I'm at home, and whoever I may be with before the day is over, I must love like Jesus. If I'm going to love like Jesus, I need to learn about Jesus. I need to have my Bible open every day, reading the stories. And the last thing is, I need to admit I can't love like Jesus. How many of you ever wore one of those WWJD bracelets? Anybody have one of those at one time? What would Jesus do? I think the intent behind it was good. I really do. I mean, I think it was, it was to get people to, to think about Christ in the particular mundane, everyday stuff of life. But I remember hearing a little story about a boy who was with his dad. And uh, they were going to go on an island in, in Michigan uh, for a, an afternoon of fun, some, one of the islands off, off Michigan. And they had two ways to get there. They could either drive their car over the bridge, or they could take the ferry, park it on this side and take the ferry, or drive over the bridge and park on the island. And he looked at his son, and he said, what should we do? The man was a Christian. The little boy was a Christian. The little boy pointed to his dad's bracelet, WWJD. He said, what would Jesus do? And the dad said, I don't think Jesus cares whether we take a bridge or we take a ferry. But he said to his son, what do you think Jesus would do? He said, I think Jesus would walk across the wire. <laughs> we can't do everything Jesus can do. So it's not about trying to love like Jesus. It's about surrendering my phony, fickle, conditional, failing, inconsistent love and yielding to the filling of the Spirit of God. So it's no longer me that's loving, it's Him loving through me. And that's when the Christian life gets exciting. Let's pray. God, thank you for uh, real love exhibited in, in nails and, and two cross beams by one who even offered forgiveness and grace to two criminals on each side of him that were worthy and deserving of the death penalty. That's your love. God, help us to grow in love for one another, that the world might know we're your disciples. Help us to meet each other's needs, not enable one another, nothing like that, just looking for genuine need and, and running to the aid of each other so that the world begins to get thirsty for what we have in the church. Help us to refrain from gossiping about anyone in the family of God as that discredits and stains the gospel. Um, and if ever called upon, help us to even lay down our physical lives as a testimony to the fact that this life isn't nearly as important as the one to come. We ask you to help us with this in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, this song